finishing meiosis. Uh, we left off completing meiosis one. Are we diploid or haploid? We are haploid. You bet. We are now haploid. How many cells do we have after meiosis one? You bet. We got two. We have divided. We have done cytokinesis one after meiosis one. Uh, and really, I can sort of, I don't want to say take my time here, but meiosis one is definitely the most intricate in meiosis. Meiosis two, as you'll see when we go through it today, is extremely similar, pretty much the exact same as mitosis. And you'll see those similarities. Uh, the only difference, of course, would be that we are starting with haploid cells, reduced chromosome number cells. We're also starting with two cells rather than one. But you're going to see that the process of meiosis two, prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase two are essentially identical to mitosis. Uh, so we're going to go through that. We're actually going to just kind of pick up where we left off with those two cells that divided last time. Uh, so if I go to my slides here, we are going to talk about the remaining phases of meiosis. Okay. So let's do it. I have a picture on my phone of where we what the cells looked like, and I can kind of even show you guys, I think. Check it out. So that's where we left off, right? Our cells divided. Each one, n equals two, they are haploid. And that's where we're going to pick up today with meiosis two in overall meiosis. So I'm going to redraw these because we're going to continue meiosis with meiosis two. And because we're starting with two cells, we're actually going to be, you, you know, we're going to have two cells for each one of these stages. Okay, so let's write meiosis two. And I'm going to redraw these cells. Uh, so let's do that first. I'm also going to emphasize again that at the very beginning of meiosis two, our cells are haploid. And we talked about haploid, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. They are haploid, meaning n equals two for both of these cells. And we mentioned last time that this, this has to do with the fact that during metaphase one, uh, the homologous chromosomes line up in the center, side by side, right? The two chromosome ones line up together, side by side, the two chromosome twos, the two chromosome threes for 46, 23 rows, 46 total. And we mentioned as opposed to mitosis where they line up single file. 46 single file. Uh, and that's how all that in mitosis, that's how all that genetic information is retained at the end of mitosis. Because you got 46 of those double stranded chromosomes lined up. And when they separate during anaphase, when those sister chromatids come apart, 
each new resultant cell is going to have 46 subsets of information, 46 chromosomes. They're single stranded, but remember those sister chromatids are identical. There's no new different information between them. So when they separate, each new cell gets all of it. And so that's how mitosis retain, that's how mitosis is diploid to diploid. No, nothing's lost, nothing, nothing's lost. But in meiosis, you do lose genetic material. Remember, we started with 2n equals 4 in our original cell. We started diploid. And because they lined up side by side, each new cell in a human would only get 23 chromosomes. Because we started with four, each new cell here gets only two. Uh, so we have do it, it get split in half, right? And we looked at independent assortment and sort of these combinations that we can get. So sperm cells, egg cells at the end of the and the end of this process are just they ha they're haploid. Our gametes are haploid due to meiosis. Um, okay, so let me finish drawing these. So they each have a nucleus. Our cell over here. Get our red and our blue out. Like this. Remember we had that crossing over, oops, we had that crossing over event, right, where those non-sister chromatids exchange segments of the chromosome. Uh, so we got a little blue here. And on this side, this is a smaller one, right? Uh, and this was larger. Okay. So we're at the very beginning of meiosis two. There's a brief interphase between meiosis one and meiosis two where the chromosomes will uh, decondense, they'll become their loose uh, spaghetti-like chromatin form again. So like I said, meiosis two is so similar to mitosis. Uh, this is all gonna sound very familiar. It's kind of review. Um, but in prophase two, so let's do prophase two. So at the very beginning of meiosis two, our chromosome or the chromatin will condense uh, after this brief interphase. Uh, the chromatin condenses. Chromatin condenses into individual chromosomes. And then what else happens during prophase? Similar to mitosis, similar to even prophase one. Who remembers what else is gonna happen? Got our condensed chromosomes. So two nuclei don't form. That, that happens during telophase, right? Uh, so we've already got two nuclei. See, these are the, the nuclear membrane. 
Ah, they've dissolved. They start to break down. Yes. So I'm going to just kind of draw or erase to represent that. The reason this is, is so that the spindle fibers, which are also present, can access the chromosomes. These uh, protein fibers can uh, attach to the chromosomes and move them around. So those are here as well. And then, let's see, let's write nuclear, or yeah, nuclear membrane breaks down. Nothing new here, all, all things we've talked about during mitosis and meiosis one actually. So do we make new ones for prophase two? E new nuclei? Um, yeah. So what happened actually, telophase one of meiosis one, the nuclei form, right? Uh, around the chromosomes at either end of the cell that's gonna divide. And so once the cell divides, they have nuclei. They, they each have a nucleus surrounding the chromosomes. Uh, if that answers your question. So like right before meiosis two, there, there were already nuclei present because during telophase one, right before this uh, second cell division, if you will, they the nuclei formed. So that's a hallmark of telophase. So cytokinesis, it's before cytokinesis uh, during telophase. So telophase one is always uh, followed by cytokinesis. And during telophase one, yeah, so telophase one is when the nucleus, nucleus will form at either end, two nuclei, and then cytokinesis will split them. And by the time the new interphase begins, those two nuclei have fully formed. But that process begins during telophase. And you'll see in telophase two, with our two new cells here, our nuclei will reform again. You'll see that though eventually. Here. Okay. All right, so let's continue meiosis two. So the next phase is metaphase two. Metaphase two, not metaphase one, right? And Interestingly enough, it always helps to remember that meiosis two is similar to mitosis because just like mitosis during meiosis two, metaphase of meiosis two, chromosomes are gonna, they're not aligning side by side in meiosis two, they're gonna align single file just like they did during mitosis. So let's, let's draw that. And 
and our spindle fibers move them to the center. Our nuclei have completely dissolved at this point. Oh, those already kind of look in the center. <laughs> Let me just, I'll redraw this one. There you go. Okay, so let's write chromosomes align in the center of the cell. Uh, I should have written chromosomes align single file in the center of the cell, but let's just write that in parentheses here, single file. We can underline it. Chromosomes align in the center of the cell, single file like this. They're not side by side this time. That's just like how they line up in metaphase of mitosis. All right. Onward. Anaphase two. Again, like mitosis, we're going to separate sister chromatids to either end of the cell. So let's, let's draw that. Oh, that's too big. <laughs> that's too big. There we go. So that's what that cell would look like. Move this up a little bit. I'm looking at my screen, let's make this a little darker here. Oops, gosh. There we go. Okay. Spindle fibers are connected. There we go. And then this side.
It's kind of funky. Okay, there we go. Oh, is one of them half red, half blue? Yes, kind of. Uh, it's not independent assortment, so let me clarify that. This is continuing from last time, right? And what our cells left off as after the end of meiosis one. And during meiosis one, specifically during prophase one, when our homologous pairs find each other and uh, match up, sometimes, quite frequently actually, uh, on average, like 13 pairs do this. And I'll kind of visually draw it here for you. So let me draw a homologous pair. So let's say these are our two chromosome sixes or something. Remember we have two pair, we have 23 pairs. Uh, so let's do, so our sixth pair, we have two chromosome sixes, one from mom, one from dad. Let's say they, they're, they found each other during prophase one of meiosis one. So a mechanism that can happen is that, remember these are sister chromatids for this chromosome six, right? From the dad. And then they, this is, these are sister chromatids, identical uh, segments of DNA attached to one another from the mom, chromosome six. What can happen during meiosis one is non-sister chromatids. So these, right, can cross over. So this is called crossing over. And it's when a piece of them, each one breaks off and swaps places, sometimes called gene swapping. Uh, but these large DNA segments are gonna exchange, okay? And so that's why I drew it kind of like that. It's not half, it's usually the ends here. Uh, it can vary a little bit at what length, but uh, they'll kind of just break off and swap like that. And this is sort of a mechanism of creating more genetic diversity. These chromosomes are now different or even more different than they were before, right? It's another variation. This chromosome has part of this now, that was different before. Uh, or, you know, it's a different chromosome and now it has part of it. So that's, this is, this was crossing over. This takes place in prophase one. Independent assortment was, occurred during metaphase one. That was when they line up side by side, the homologous pairs, right, in the center, but which side they line up on is completely random. It's totally independent. And that was when we calculated how many variations, how many combinations can result from where they line up. Uh, and it was like 8 million, right, per gamete. So when sperm and egg come together, each one had 8 million possibilities of where the maternal and paternal chromosomes line up. And so uh, you can, you do 8 million times 8 million. And that's the total genetic diversity uh, probability. And it's 64 trillion combinations. And that didn't even include crossing over because e each crossing over event is another genetic variation possibility. Because this it, crossing over can occur on some chromosomes and sometimes it doesn't. So it's, it's just another way to introduce more variation. And we, we spoke a little briefly about how that's important in evolution, right? And disease resistance and you don't want this entirely uniform homogenous population where everybody's genetically the same 
because if one person is susceptible to a disease, then everyone is because they're everybody's the same. So evolution has really favored uh, this, the, or all of these types of mechanisms to increase diversity. Okay, back to anaphase two. <laughs> uh, okay, so that was some good review though, for sure. Especially because you have your exam next class. So during anaphase two, sister chromatids are pulled by the spindle fibers to opposite ends of uh, each cell. We're still with two cells, right? Get out of your way there, sorry. So as you can see here, the chromatids are being pulled apart to either end of each one of the cells, just like we see in mitosis. Is a question. They are now single-stranded. You bet. Absolutely. Yep. Awesome. And we're going to see that once we finish this uh, process, because we are now on our last phase. Telophase two, unless you include cytokinesis as a phase, but not really. It's just kind of that splitting of the cytoplasm. But okay, so telophase two requires kind of redrawing a little bit. The cell elongates, right? Starts to pinch in. So let's uh, see if I can. Good enough. I'm not an artist. <laughs> Just a scientist. Professor person. Okay. And by now, these chromosomes have reached either end. So let's do, get rid of that. Let's... Okay, that cell's done. Let's do this cell now. This lecture is always just like a lot of a lot of color and capping of pens. <laughs> okay, so this one so is a big red and blue.
Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> sort of. The job is done, though. Gets the job done. And annoyingly, this is one of the toughest lectures during COVID because typically I don't erase, you know, I keep these up and I have giant whiteboards. I can, you know, have cell after cell, uh, which is easy for you for notes. That's what I want you to be doing, right? Uh, you don't want to erase or cross things out. You want it for studying, uh, but we're adapting. Okay, so just like mitosis, just like really telophase one of meiosis one, uh, the big event here, two nuclei are being reformed in each cell. Let's write that. I'm gonna try and get out of the way, but so two nuclei, nuclei, oh yeah, oops. Are uh, formed in each cell. And this, of course, is surrounding the chromosomes that are now single stranded as uh, Glorianne, I believe, said. Yeah. So you can start to see here why or how, really, we're going to end up with four total cells at the end of all this. Two cell divisions during meiosis. Started with one, end up with four. Okay. And the last event, our second cytokinesis, division of the cytoplasm for both of these cells. So they pinch in this contractile ring forms and pinches the cells into two. By now our nuclei have fully formed the nuclear envelope or membrane. Same thing with these cells. Jeez, I'm going more around here. There we go. And during cytokinesis, this is when the cytoplasm divides uh, into two new cells, and that happened in both of them, so we have four total. Two new cells. So, 
we have four now. Wow, cool. <laughs> and each one is haploid. N equals two. All righty. Give you guys another minute to write this down. Oop, because I know you're probably writing new or drawing new cells. Get my notes up here. Okay. Is anyone still writing? Just type in the chat if you're still drawing this out. Just say yes or, uh, and then I can just wait longer or. No, oh, all right. Really? Glorianne's chilling. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll keep it up just here for now. Let's take a look at the slides. Essentially, what we've done here is like we did in that summary table and our comparing and contrasting table between mitosis, meiosis, we've fulfilled exactly what we set out to do. So it was the who, what, where, when, why, how. So the what, what we were doing, we set out to begin with one diploid cell with two sets of chromosomes at the very beginning of meiosis. And this was a germline cell in the ovaries for female, testes for males. These germline cells undergo meiosis and they go from diploid one diploid cell to four haploid cells. So that's what we've done. These are four genetically unique haploid cells. They are different from one another due to the fact that they're, they've lost genetic information and some have genetic information that others don't. Uh, so we've done that. This is sort of why meiosis is sometimes referred to as reduction division this loss of genetic information due to the fact of going from diploid, 46 total chromosomes, to haploid where each cell has 23. Of course, I didn't draw 23, that would, we'd be here all night. I did it with four just to show the mechanism and how this happens, but it's really due to the fact that they line up side by side during metaphase one rather than single file. This is how in mitosis, each new cell is going to retain all of that information. Sister chromatids come apart, but they're identical. Uh, and speaking of which, meiosis two, after meiosis one, very similar to mitosis, these sister chromatids are coming apart uh, and we get four cells at the end of the day. So really, uh, there's not much more to talk about. I'm, I'm gonna do a little review, show you kind of what the textbook pictures. Uh, 
and then talk about one more thing related to what happens when there's an error in meiosis. But other than that, uh, I might end a little earlier. We'll see where we get. But I do want to ask if anyone has any questions about what we've done so far in meiosis two or meiosis in general. <coughs> any questions? Okay, well, if you're typing, I will see it. But let's, uh, let's take a look at the slides again. Ah, I did want to mention this. So I did already kind of touch upon this point. Oh, someone. Oh, so by the end of all this, we get four new haploid cells. Couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly right. Yes. So in a human, when we start with 46 in a diploid cell, at the end of all of this, all the four gamete cells at the end have 23 single-stranded chromosomes. Uh, and some of them have crossing over like some interesting variation there, but uh, that's exactly correct. So speaking of variation, what features of meiosis and sexual reproduction give rise to such extreme genetic diversity? We kind of touched upon this, but just as a review, I guess, what would you guys say? What, what are the mechanisms we've discussed that will contribute to this genetic variation? Seeing if you're all awake and not looking at the election like I am. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to teaching, and I want to take a break from it. <laughs> so what? Wonderful. Crossing over, absolutely. Uh, An independent assortment. And yeah, those are the main ones. Uh, also, sort of, yeah, the, the fact that uh, the union of a sperm cell and egg cell uh, is random as well. That's sort of, I get, there's no like, uh, there are no sperm cells or egg cells that are, that have an advantage, I guess you could say, in being fertilized and making the new offspring. So that's just, you know, it's a textbook thing. I do like to include it though. That's a completely random process. So let's talk about that. Crossing over, like you said, this is exactly what crossing over is, as we've discussed. Independent assortment uh, as well. Uh, I just want you to know, technically, it does occur during metaphase two as well, but this is only if crossing over occurs. The reason being, uh, might as well just briefly talk about it, just, just for your understanding. So you see these, actually, is that, well, let me, uh, let me erase one, actually. I'll show you what I mean by this. So at the beginning of meiosis two, one of our, in each cell, a chromosome had crossing over occur. Well, what if, and you know, they line up in the center during metaphase two, right? What if I drew this chromosome like this? And this is totally possible. Uh, if I drew it. Like that. Essentially, the sister chromatids can line up independent as well. And so if crossing over occurred, remember the sister chromatids are identical, but if crossing over occurred, they aren't really identical, are they? These two strands aren't identical to each other. Uh, I just want you to know that the main 
uh, independent assortment occurs during metaphase one. But just as an a just as an aside, and for you to know, kind of, and maybe that helps with understanding what I meant by that. Um, and if the textbook mentions it as well, but really metaphase one, just know that. <laughs> if I were to ask you, then metaphase one. Uh, okay. And metaphase two, chromatid. I yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. And like I mentioned, random fertilization. Sperm and egg, uh, they don't really have advantage. It's just kind of a random, you know, there's trillions of sperm cells and uh, well, you get trillions of eggs, but only 46, I believe, or so make it. And it's random which one meets up with which. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Let's do Going in result. We've kind of talked a lot about this already. Okay, this is what I wanted to show you. So this is just from the textbook. Uh, get my notes and see what I want to emphasize. So just as a, you know what, I, I like to do this. I like to recap everything. And during, so this is meiosis one, as you can see. Uh, and during, uh, I won't go through each one, spare you that, but you can see there's some crossing over occurring in prophase one between our homologous pairs here. Uh, metaphase one, they've lined up side by side, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and oh, just you know, to reemphasize that after meiosis one, we are haploid now. Uh, because they lined up side by side. So by meiosis two, we are now haploid. So here we are at meiosis two, we begin haploid, reduced chromosome number in each new cell. How long does this process take in real time? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on cell type. I actually don't know exactly but I do, I think, know from mitosis, if it's an actively dividing cell, like in the tip of an onion root or skin cells, mitosis takes, I think about, I wanna say eight hours maybe. It's kind of a long process, I think, but it does depend on cell type. Begin with two haploid after metaphase one. After meiosis one, uh, you're gonna have two haploid cells once it divides. Uh, so during meiosis one, crossing over ha uh, happens. Yes, specifically, uh, specifically, if I go back, uh, prophase one of meiosis one. This is when crossing over occurs. Okay. And like we just drew out in meiosis two, very similar to uh, mitosis, the sister chromatids separate now. Uh, telophase nuclei form, blah, blah, blah. We get four cells, each half the original number of chromosomes. Cool. Can we get these images? I think they're they're on my PowerPoint slides. They should be updated uh, on Canvas under modules. Yes, someone has them, hopefully. But anyways, yes, they should be. I've had these images for a long time, so. Okay, one more concept I wanna talk about today. Uh, and we'll see if we can get out early. <laughs> um, I always, sometimes I say that and it just never happens, but we'll, we'll hopefully. Uh, oh, does each haploid after meiosis one have 46? Uh, no, it's a great question. So it's a great question. You start with 46 chromosomes at the very beginning of meiosis. And when you enter meiosis one, you have 
one cell with 46 chromosomes. At the end of meiosis one, so after telophase one and cytokinesis one, you have two cells that have 23 chromosomes each. So that reduction, you go from diploid to haploid by the end of meiosis one. So you start meiosis two, each new cell would have 23 chromosomes each. They have less than what they started with. And then meiosis two, you start with 23 in each one and you also end with 23. But like mitosis, you're just going from double-stranded to single-stranded. That's the beauty. You still, you retain it. It's then that's why it's so similar to mitosis. They line up single file and that's primarily why. Okay, let's take a look at this. Anyone notice something with this karyotype that's not exactly good? Or what's different about this karyotype? What's different about it? Let me erase the board here. Okay, let me check the chat. X and Y are paired, technically. They just didn't draw them next to each other. Uh, so don't pay attention to that. <laughs> um, let's see. So X and Y, that means it's a male, right? Uh, let's see. Three in 21. That's what I'm looking for. Totally. So check it out. Maybe it, you, it eluded you because it's so small here. But there are three chromosome 21s. No bueno, not good. You want one of each. You want, you don't want two, uh, what am I trying to say? You don't want, you don't want a third one. <laughs> you want one from mom, one from dad. You don't want two from mom and one from dad. You want two from dad, one from mom. You don't want, ever want that. So this is called a trisomy. Uh, and specifically, this is trisomy 21. It's the only trisomy that exists where the offspring makes it past reproductive age. Does anyone know this, uh, the genetic disease that this causes? Trisomy 21, the third 21. Yeah, it's Down syndrome, yeah. Yeah, so essentially, if you have a third chromosome of any other chromosome, like you, somehow, you got a third chromosome 11 or a third chromosome 13, uh, they don't survive. And often miscarriages, uh, this is primarily the main cause. Uh, they, they can't live past uh, a certain uh, stage in the embryo. So it's pretty, pretty sad. So what causes this? It's called, it's an error in meiosis. So how does this happen? It's called non-disjunction. Non-disjunction. So we're going to define non-disjunction and then take a quick look at what's going on that would uh, result in something like this. So non-disjunction is the failure of chromosomes to separate during when 
chromosomes separate, separate uh, or chromatids uh, during either anaphase one. So I'm going to write meiosis one, and in parentheses, more specifically, anaphase one, or meiosis two. more specifically, anaphase two. So let's let's see how this happens. So we'll look at the first scenario uh, first, where so on the left side, where the non disjunction event occurs during meiosis one. So here are homologous pairs separating during anaphase one, right? So that's normal. That looks okay. That's what's supposed to happen. This is the non-disjunction during anaphase one. The homologous pairs didn't separate. They went to one side on accident. And so it actually leaves this, after meiosis one, it leaves this cell lacking chromosomes. Uh, and then it leaves this cell with an extra. So at the end of the day, your gametes will be n plus one on this side and n minus one on this side. Uh, OK. So that's how you could have an extra chromosome in this gamete here. This is non-disjunction during meiosis two on this side, the right side, where the sister chromatids don't separate properly. Right. And so this cell actually ends up fine with the proper number. Uh, but of course, because we have two cells, the non disjunction occurred in one of them here. And when it happened, you get uh, an extra chromosome in this cell and a missing chromosome in this cell. Uh, so it's. Um, yeah, it's not good. And that's how it happens. Why does it not cause miscarriage in 21? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I actually don't know, to be completely honest. But my best guess is that what I do know is that uh, a lot of the a lot of the genes on these chromosomes are so important in human functioning and cell functioning that if you have too much genetic information for any of it, it can it overwhelms the cell and it just it's it's too much protein. It's too much being made. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure chromosome 21 is considered the least important chromosome. The information on it, essentially when you overproduce these proteins because you have extra information. It doesn't cause developmental issues because these proteins might not affect the most important things like organ function, for example. It might, it might, they might be involved in growth and in de maybe development or, and the things that you might see with a Down syndrome patient, uh, but that can, you can survive on. That's my best guess. But that's a great question. I'm, that's kind of my best interpretation. Um, OK, so it's 4.11. I promised I'd let you go early. 
not as early as I'd hoped, but that's it. That's what the book says. Oh, cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> good. <laughs> My guess was good. Um, so last thing, you got the lecture exam on Tuesday. Please, if you can fill out the student evals, just a reminder, uh, that would be awesome. And uh, blah, 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 what else? Well, next time I see you will be Thursday. You have your exam and we'll know who the president is. Ah! All right, so any other questions? OMG is right. All right. Lab due tomorrow. Thank you. Forgot about that. Yes. Totally, totally. Wait, wait, wait. So recording of, yeah, I'll send the recording for next week's lab uh, on Tuesday night. Yeah. Yeah, so we won't be meeting for anything, just, just like last time. You'll just take your exam in that window of time on Tuesday. Uh, and I'll send out lab lecture recording as well as the packet and everything like I do. All right, I'll see you guys. Good luck on your exams or exam, yeah. <laughs> Have a great weekend, everyone.